this association has done. And I'm very aware of all of what went on in uh, Lee County. I've been here many times for many conferences, especially in, in, uh, in uh, church training and about uh, discipleship and all that business. But uh, I've been retired, and uh, so I'm not only doing interim type work, but also uh, I got my, my uh, I, uh, I got my degree in uh, history, and so uh, the Lord, I think so, told me when I was retiring, it's time to use your history. So He opened doors that is unbelievable. I'm the uh, I'm the chaplain of the SCV, Sons of the Confederate Veterans for Hines and Madison County. But also, I'm the chaplain for the, we call it the SAR, Sons of America and the Revolution, like the DAR or the SAR. But I'm the state representative, the chaplain. Before me was the Episcopalian priest. They'd never seen a creature like me. <laughs> and I had many men all over the state come up to me. You do these praise songs and moral services? I said, yeah. Man, I love your prayer. What did you do when I read that from? You know, this pains had everything. They had certain prayer. I said, it's right here in the heart. Yeah. They don't understand that. Lots of them don't understand that. Because they've been, you know, led by the Episcopalian priest. But anyway, I've been having some great man moments and, and sharing the gospel of Christ through these men and all that. I uh, really had an enjoyable time before the service uh, talking to Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer had, and I had lots of things in common, especially in the music field. And, uh, but also, I didn't tell her this. Uh, my parents were born in 1910. All right? For many of you, that being your grandfather or your great grandfather. These were my parents, born in 1910. There are three of us boys in the family. And I was the least of the three, and even the smallest of the three. I have a, I have a six, seven and a half inch brother uh, who was all American from Mississippi State in basketball and played on my great 1963 team where they had a high from the governor and legislature. There's a missing store there. He was the center for that great team. And I got a six, four brother, all of them had played basketball just like I have and coach as well. And uh, even my mother did with coaches at one time. And uh, so when they were 39 years old, guess who they had? Me. I didn't know later on in life I had six or eight adult parents. All right? At 39, they had me. And, uh, and so you know, back then, they didn't know who, uh, what kind of, you know, you'd be a girl or a boy. And so they already planned that no, and they were certain that would be a girl. So they already had a name prepared for me. It was Jennifer. So we had more in common. So, all right? And when I came out into the world, they were shot and, and everything, so they wound up under the main gleam. So I, the rest of the story, Paul Harvey, some of you might remember him, uh, and what he says and so forth. I'm glad to be here, and Quite a few weeks ago, about over a, a month and a half ago, the pastor called me about coming here. And, uh, and so I began to start thinking and everything, and you need to be close to Thanksgiving and what, you know, what, what do you want me to do, Lord? And all through these weeks, he's preparing me for this message about, uh, about thinking about Thanksgiving. And it's what he called, I call the three key words of love. There are three key words of love and that we need to be more thankful for. You'll know the first two, but I doubt it seriously you'll know the third. And yet God said it very plainly in the Bible. Alright? The first one, what? Love God with all your mind, heart, and soul. Alright? Then he said, Love your neighbor as your what? Self. Now what is this curious word that's a third line? Well, let's turn into the area of Matthew. Matthew, the uh, sixth chapter, and we're going to look at, uh, we're going to start looking at the uh, uh, 43rd verse, all right? 
Alright. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But, this is Jesus speaking, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And send rain on the just and on the unjust. Love your enemies. But the main verse I want us to look at is in Luke. So if you have your Bibles, Luke, uh, be the, the sixth chapter, and starting with the 27th verse. This is what I call the bookend of this love. The bookend. So start off with this, and it will end with the same. Alright? And so it says here, But say to you who hear, Love your enemies, do good to them who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. To him who strikes you on one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your coat, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. Are you catching on what Jesus is telling these people? And just as you want men to do to you, do also to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lean to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lean to, uh, to sinners to receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good to them. And live hoping for nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be the sons of the Most High. And He is kind to the unfaithful and the evil. Therefore, be merciful, just as the Father also is merciful. May God bless the reading of His Word this morning. In Matthew, it shows us and starts showing us how they was taught this. Disciples as well. And the Pharisees, the people was taught to love your enemies. No, do not love your enemies. Hate your enemies. So here Jesus is trying to unlearn them about this whole matter of loving your enemy. And that's how important this third love is. But we don't talk about it too much because it's too much to comprehend. And I hope this morning God will open up our heart and our lives to what it means. Let's look at the, the first two examples. You love your enemies, then you do what? You do good to them. He didn't say just love your enemies. I can say like here, man, I know so and so, I love him, I love him, I love him, but don't do the one thing. That is not love what God is talking about. Love him, you also do good to him. Really? You don't know what they did to me, but God. That's why he's stating that statement. And that fact is a book in. You see down on the 35th verse, the love your enemies and do good. You repeat it as a book in of this love. And then do good. I don't know how many of you remember this back in October 2006. It shocked the world and shocked the face of our nation when a man came into an Amish community and went into a school and killed eight teenage girls. I don't know if you remember that or not. But people from all over the world came to this this area of the Amish family. And uh, I never did the next morning I would watch the NBC and everybody 
um, interviewing them and talking to them and so forth. And I was listening to this one journalist uh, that was interviewing this uh, uh, Amish man. He had his beard and all that. And he was, his back was to a cornfield that was cut down to the ground. And so this guy, asked, this journalist asked all kinds of questions. Why do you wear the beard? You know, why do you wear the ladies, wear the little cap? Why do you do all that? And as he was talking, there was a couple walking in, uh, through the cornfield behind this man's back uh, with a basket. And this journalist stopped and looked. He said, that's kind of weird. Now there's a couple going uh, with a basket right behind. So he turned and looked at him. Oh, yes, yes. He said, that's kind of interesting. Said, well, what they're doing, this couple, they're carrying some food to the widow of the ones that killed the daughters. Right down the road. And they're two children. How can that be? You know, how can that be? I mean, just a few hours ago, they killed those girls. And now you got somebody here in your office is going down and feed the enemy. That's exactly what he said. Feed the enemy. And God said, let me tell you something else. This couple, one of the eight girls for their daughter. And man, he, he stopped and he didn't know what to say. And that, how can this be? And this honest man made a statement that shook my heart. This is our lifestyle. See, they've been brought up. No matter how hateful people are, to keep on loving them, just like the scripture has said, just like Jesus Christ is trying to put out to us this morning, to love our enemies and do good. That's a lifestyle. And it's not just come overnight. Either. It's a lifestyle for them, for the kids that are brought up with this whole matter of loving your enemy. Whatever they do to you or to your family. Can we get in that lifestyle? But the, uh, the third thing we see is the blessing. We need to learn how to bless them in, in the ways. And then the, the fourth one, the pray for those who despitefully use you. Woo! That's pretty hard. Isn't it? As I was telling Jennifer uh, at the college, I went out as a U.S. 2 missionary uh, at that time with a whole mission board, now the North American Mission Board. And U.S. 2 is <clears throat> two years in the home front, just like in the same thing as a German is two years in the foreign fields, all right? Okay? And we go on the same basis uh, of the, the two years. You cannot be married in either one to be a U.S. 2 missionary or a German at that time. So anyway, I went out and they uh, signed me to a place in Northern Nevada. Sorry, say Nevada. That's what the neighbors called Nevada. I had a deacon one time after I, when I mentioned that. He went to the what well, Nevada is between California and Utah. And uh, Nevada, between California and Utah. Oh, that's Nevada. Right. But anyway, <laughs> so I want to make sure you understand where I was. I'm in the northern part in the desert. All right, I'm not, not even near about close to Las Vegas. So I, I, I did have a, a Reno, all that area, in my uh, ministry, my missions uh, that we had out there as well. And, uh, and so here, uh, here I'm coming out there, and, uh, and this is about uh, a few months I've been there. And, and one place on Monday night, I went to Crescent Valley. Crescent Valley is where the second is. It's a small little village out in the desert, two hours from my drive, where I live, out in the desert, and one huge mountain. It's a mercury mine. I didn't know they have mines up in the bottom. They even have a gold mine in the little town I lived in. The only gold mine around, you know. But even a mercury mine, and so they had a little store that also had a bar, and that's it. But we had a little Baptist mission. We had a staff there, and a little building there. And so I went around 50 mile radius and picking up kids. Some of them walked 10 and 12 miles to a Monday to be there. I mean, nothing else to do. You either get drunk or take drugs. And now I saw a 10 year old girl, my boy, drunk as can be, 
and the parents didn't care. You know, that's kind of attitude. And so anything goes when it came to the mission. And I can have a good 35 or of all ages. All right? And they curse and they use knives and we got in lots of fights. I had a breakup. One time one of the teenagers drove his motorcycle into our mission and I grabbed him behind the head and threw him against the wall and said, you never can do this again. That is not my nature at all. And so that's the kind of thing that plays in the wall. And I came to the point I dread going on Mondays to the Crescent Valley. So I had a keen eye here. So I will uh, carry some of uh, uh, maybe a, a, a few of the girls and boys uh, from our little, little Bible study that we have a dynamic Bible study. And they go out and we sing there in that little small town that I live in. And with our missionary, I do. I have a full time missionary that I work with as well. And I live in a mission compound. And uh, but anyway, we uh, so I, I did, and, and, uh, and we drove out there, and uh, and I told them what we're going to face. I told you this is all kinds, and I want you to realize that everything you do, they're watching you. You know, so we got there, and before I got out of out of the uh, car, one of the boys uh, uh, induced himself to one of the girls, took him behind the mission, and she was half dressed, undressed when I found her. She was willing to do it, and I know I can feel it wasn't. So afterwards, everything was wrong. Everything they did was off the devil and not off the Lord Jesus Christ. And all the way back, those two hours, I really preached to them. How I was disappointed in them, you know, that, that uh, you should be ashamed of yourself and how you reacted. And I went on and on. When we got back the next morning, especially the three girls, got up in front of the high school. And so there's a little missionary from Mississippi that did a sexual... Uh, uh, a sexual assault on us. And it shocked everybody. And they even, uh, and the word got out to different places and uh, in stores and everything like that. Finally, I was put on a house arrest. And there, I couldn't get out. The policeman was right there in the front door. 24 hours. What would you do? I asked my missionary, that I have high respect for. So tell me what to do. So I'm going to share two things with you. Learn how to pray without ceasing. i never forget that. You know where that is? First Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. How many of you pray without ceasing? Oh, I pray every day. I didn't say that. How many of you pray without ceasing? All throughout the day and night. For that lost person, all day and night. You know, pray without ceasing. Second thing he said, put in your mind, don't blame everything on them. You know, they, they were wrong. But when people ask you, you tell the truth. So don't always put them down. Didn't quite understand that. Don't put them down. And that's what I did for the next five days. It was H-E-L-L in my heart that I was in. <clears throat> and I saw my life, I saw my mission, all gone. Thanks to this missionary constantly reminding me that he loves me and he supported me. So finally, after the fifth or sixth day, there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door and there were the three girls. And I came out to make sure the policeman was watching. I said, what y'all want? And they handed me a letter. Asking for my forgiveness. And I said, is this really true from all three of y'all? And they said, yes. Can I ask you a question? And yes. Why? Why you did that? Why do you accuse me so falsely? And they made this statement I never forget. I thought you would start blaming us for everything and start condemning us to hell and everything else. And we saw a spirit in you we never knew anybody had. And I told him, I said, well, you know my name, my mission, and everything is up to you. You know, it's up to you what can be determined. And to their credit, 
They went to every, they went back to the uh, high school that next day, told them they had told a lie and everything, and they went to churches and little missions, telling people, I mean, to their credit, they did. In a month's time, they never did know. I never heard another word of it for the next few years. See, what do you do? When people accuse you falsely, and you are people that have hurt you and all of that, you know, we need to learn how to do good. We need to learn how to bless them. We need to learn how to pray without ceasing. And what God can do. The fifth one comes down here in the 35th verse. The Lord said, love your enemies, do good. And then he said something very strange. He said, hoping for nothing in return. Please forgive me. I'm so sorry for this. Jesus said, don't expect anything in return. Until that person said he's sorry, until he said, I'll ask for my, his forgiveness of that, uh, and all, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk to him anymore. You are doing opposite to what Jesus has said about the enemy. Don't expect anything in return. Man, that is hard. When you've been abused, when you've been hurt, and like one dear friend has been raped, you know? That's hard to do. But yet, that's what Jesus said. That's why this love is the hardest love of that ever been in the Bible. For all of us. For Satan is using it well and right. In World War II, concentration camps were developed by the Nazis. Any of you have been in a concentration camp? We have. We actually went to one out in uh, Berlin. As a matter of fact, the first one. And really walked the grounds and felt, uh, felt the, the hate and all like that. It was unbelievable. The concentration camps, and there was one called Ravenberg Concentration Camp. It's all women. All women. One of them, over 50,000 women, was killed, tortured, and all. You ever heard of Connie from Fort Timberland? Who wrote The Hiding Place? This is where she was. Read it. You read The Hiding Place and how God led her out without anybody saying anything. You know, moral story of the Spirit of God. But she saw her sister die in that camp. And so, uh, as our troops came in to Raymond the Buck, and all, and all what they did, and all that, they said oh, lots of garbage, and, and lots of you know, everything else of, of human beings who once was. One man saw something crumble in a piece of paper uh, next to his shoe. He reached down and started reading it, and started crying. And he got some other men around. He said, I want you to listen to what this woman said before she died. And here is what she said. They call it the impossible forgiveness. She said, Oh Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. But do not remember the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Remember the fruits we brought, and thanks to this suffering, our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, the courage, the generosity, and the greatness of heart, which had grown out of this. The greatness of heart had been grown out of this? But she went on and said, and when they come to judgment, let all the fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Goodness gracious, how can a person do that? How can a person believe in that? I don't care if they're born again and believers, and, you know, they know the Bible from uh, Genesis and Revelation. How can a person believe that? That's exactly what we just read from God's Word. The impossible forgiveness. The impossible forgiveness that Jesus did on the cross. Forgive them for what they are doing. Do you remember? 
the impossible produce. Same thing this woman experienced. And Ben, I, I constantly read this all the time about trying to find ways to forgive somebody, whatever I read this. I said, wow, I have never had that experience. But yet, I can see what God can do when we turn it all over to Him. Forgiveness. And what forgiveness is all about. All of us have been types of things that have happened to us. I didn't want to say this this morning because it was hard enough. But when I was a junior in college, in Louisiana College, I was in Pineville, Louisiana, the only Baptist college in Louisiana, just like in the city, not by their sisters. I was leading music in a church that had a very talented pastor. He played an organ, piano. He was an artist. He drew pictures for the children's <coughs> ministry of the Bible. I mean, unbelievable in this small church. I couldn't believe they had a pastor. Some good pictures, you know. One day, I don't want to tell you the whole story, but I was in, uh, he wanted to come to his office. And, uh, and we started talking and, and things. And so he showed me some things that he had seen that had been sent to him. And uh, it was uh, terrible. And so he wanted to burn them. So we went to the bathroom to burn them. And then, uh, then he came out to me and raped me. A bus went from him and ran to the backyard where his son was in the yard and start uh, talking to him. And after a while, I said, oh, that didn't really happen, you know. So I went back into my music room, uh, to put up some music, and he came and did it again. When I had to leave, and I ran, and when I had to leave, I had to go through his office. He was standing at the door. I pulled out my knife. He didn't see it. So I pulled out my knife, and I said, God, if you touch me again, I will kill you. And for some reason, the spirit proves me. My Bible was on the edge of the corner of this desk. And I reached in it and put it right in toward it, like he was Satan himself. And he walked away. I went back to Louisiana College, and I said, God, I am not going back. And God continued to show me, you are going back. All that week, in the Friday, his, uh, his wife called me up. Said, my husband's having a nervous breakdown. Oh, really? You know? And she started crying. Come and talk to him. I am not going to talk to him. She called me five times. The last time, I said, I'm coming. I was coming to resign. Period. But anyway, after the worship service was a terrible service. I mean... Music was bad, and everything was bad. Because I think we all do bad. You know, I but I went to his office after he wanted to see me, and I was going to uh, resign that morning. I already told him he said I want to see me, and he started telling me that um, that he had prayed to God and, and he's crying and that asked God for forgiveness. And then he turned to me and said, now, I've already, "I'm sitting clear across the room with my knife in my hand." Can you forgive? And I started realizing uh, what uh, Cora Tempu went through. And then I started reading this verse. And I've been reading that verse all week long that we just read to me. And when I say, and, I, and, and, and let me tell you one thing about Cora Tempu. She was speaking in Munich, Germany, giving her testimony. And in this huge crowd said, and it's also a book that uh, he went down, a uh, little shake hand, be friendly. And he said he saw a man coming down that she hated more than the devil himself. He was a caregiver, a caretaker at Bunch. She had seen this man kill babies, Jewish babies with his hands. And hate him more than the devil himself, she said. And as he come down, she would try to be pulled out and shake your hand. But she had so much hate in her heart, she couldn't bring up her hand to shake hands with her. 
That's where I was. I couldn't shake my hand with him. You know, I had so much hate and bitterness in my heart and soul. And finally, when she asked God to forgive her, her, her hand also came up, and he made she made a statement, I'll never forget. And grabbed that man's hand and said, I felt the Spirit of God I have never felt before. See how powerful forgiveness is when you let God have it. And when I said to him, I forgive you, I felt the same spirit that Corinth and Boone felt that day. And we became good friends. Because I realized that something that came over him, that Satan knew his weakness or whatever may be the situation. And we became friends. And we had reconciliation that morning. You ever had a reconciliation with him? Are you still unforgiving with him? You know I'm just saying. Don't you? So this morning, what about you? What about you? Last night I was reading some scripture and, and, uh, and I, uh, I started reading about the resurrection and uh, in John 11, 25. <coughs> and I never did that. Uh, uh, as I read, I read, I read that sometimes I get something to catch my eye I start reading it three or four times. And of course I've used this scripture verse many times in funerals like lots, lots of preachers or you know, music people have done as well. And I start reading it and reading it and reading it. And then I said, wow. Let me read this verse to you from the 11th chapter of John, the, uh, uh, the 25th verse. And remember, he, he mentioned he was talking to Moth, all right? And Moth and Mark made a statement, I know that he is, will rise again to the resurrection at the last day. Then Jesus said these words. And then he will ask her a question at the end of the church. I'll be honest with you, I've never heard, and I have never done it, ever said this question. <clears throat> but it is a part of the world. So I am the resurrection and the life. Where did that come from? I am the way, the truth, and the life. All right. No man comes to the Father, but not me. Alright? So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. But well, listen to this next verse. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Now, where have you heard this before? You ever heard of John 3.16? For God so loved the world, and gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should never perish, but have everlasting life. This is Paul right there. You know where it is again? In the 15th verse of the third chapter. Whosoever believes in me should never perish, but how eternity. Jesus said it twice. Did you know that? I didn't know that until not too long ago. I've already mentioned this to many people, uh, preachers, brothers that I have. Uh, that has doctor degrees. And they said, well, I think I remember. But one guy looked at me and said, Glenn, I don't recall. I said, thank you for being honest with me. You know? I saw other people. And I bet most of you, not all of you, probably never read that verse and saw that. Well, we're too busy to get to the 16th verse, but hey, we memorized 16th and 17th verse. Why in the world don't memorize the 15th verse? You know? What that means, there's no way. You'll no way lose your salvation. He didn't say it one time. He said it twice in a row. And now he's saying again about the resurrection. And who's, whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Shall never die. Then he asked a question. You see, you remember this. Do you believe this? And he's looking at Martha. Do you believe this? And then Martha said, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into this world. Can you say that in your own heart? What Martha said? Are you, are you sitting in your pew right now? Well, I hope so, maybe. 
you're going to hell. I'm sorry. So the Bible says very clearly in 1 John, uh, the fifth chapter, you will know you have eternal life. He didn't say maybe or hope so. Matter of fact, that's not in the Bible at all. So are you like me? I came down at a young age. I came down at a young age. And, and, uh, and uh, the pastor at the church asked me a question. He said, why do you come down here to be a Christian? See, I was in the R.A.s. I was really a bachelor for some of you who don't know what it is for boys. I was in the Bible you know. I was in the choir. You know, I was a good old boy. I know it's been a Christian. I can quote you verses by the right directions. I can know, know, quote you verses from the crucifixion. Go on memorizing. I knew it from my drills. But I was lost. I told him I wanted to be a Christian. And he didn't ask me anything else. And then he baptized me. And I thought I was saved. But I've never had experience in Jesus Christ. Until a few years later, as a young teenager, I went over to uh, Jones County. And they had a youth associational rally. And my big brother, who was a junior at Mississippi State at that time, and their basketball team, Mississippi State, was number two in the nation. He got up, and he was saved his sophomore year at Mississippi State to the BSU. And student year, he did the same thing I did. He came down at a young age, and the BSU led him to the Lord as a sophomore at Mississippi State. And he shared how he really asked Christ in his heart. And I stood up there as a young teenager. I had never had that experience. And I never get, get on my knees behind the pew and pray for God in my heart. And now I am saying, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, and who is to come and to this world. Can you say that? Can you say that? When you get your life right. The Bible says in Romans, today the day of salvation, not tomorrow. You don't know it, you don't even expect that if you go out that door, you'll be living for next Sunday. You know? So if you have doubts in your mind, you better get it right. You better get it right. So you only have one chance. And this is a chance this morning. Okay. And also for the area of forgiveness. And what forgiveness is all about. And loving your enemies and doing good. Have you released and surrendered that to Jesus? Have you really done that? Or are you sitting back there still mad at these people? And you still got that evil spirit in your heart. And you're still listening to the devil. You listen to you still listen to the devil rather than Jesus Christ this morning. And then we sit back and say, Oh, I'm a Christian. You might be a Christian, but who are you listen to? Who are you listening to? Just remember, the devil is the author of fear. During COVID, were you scared to death? Were you in fear? Did you go to the Bible? Did you see God's face? Or are you sitting there in your fear because Satan said, Man, I got you! The hand joy is COVID. Because of our stupidity, not knowing what Satan would do with all his might and power, and lack the knowledge of what Jesus wanted to do. But you got to choose. You got to choose. He's waiting for you this morning. And as we will stand and sing in just a moment for our for Jennifer to come up and play for our invitation. And uh, Brother Brian will be coming down here and sitting in front uh, to receive you. I want you to really think what is God saying to you this morning? You learn how to surrender this morning. And then confess it this morning. And he will be down here. And then if needs to, I'll be down here. So I'd like for us to stand right now and come. Let's stand. Preparing our hearts to be the master. For he's here. And I see his faces here this morning. Disturbing looks. I don't know what it is. I don't know what God does. 